Good morning and welcome to the Business Standard Morning Show. I'm Debar Ghesanyal. It's the 29th of August 2023 and here are the questions we'll be answering today. Will Bharat NCAP make your car safer? How did India Inc. help Chandrayaan 3 land on the moon? How have markets interpreted RIL's 46th AGM? And what is the Shiv Shakti point? How safe is this car? Consumers are increasingly posing this question to showroom managers while scanning a new brand. While looks definitely matter, safety features too are becoming an integral part of the overall package. India recently launched its own vehicle safety norm which will be voluntary and will come into effect from October 1. It will be called Bharat NCAP. Abhijit Kumar drives you through this long-awaited initiative, exploring if it will make your cars safer. Accidents have gone up exponentially. Uh, you said some time back that road accidents could be worse than uh, COVID-19 pandemic impact. So why are Indian roads killers? Or is that a misinterpretation? Actually, frankly speaking, this is the only field where from last seven to eight years, I try my level best, but I could not get success. I'm ready to accept it. Maybe my defeat, I can accept it. We have five lakhs accidents and one lakh fifty thousand deaths. Union Minister Nitin Gadkari went on to list four problem areas which are leading to such a large number of accidents. The first was road engineering, second, automobile engineering, third, emergency care, and fourth, awareness about road safety. And on August 22nd, Gadkari rolled out Bharat and Cap to address the second problem area, that is automotive safety. While work is still on to tackle the other three issues, Bharat and Cap will ensure that car passengers are relatively safe in case of any unfortunate tragedy. Designed on the lines of global NCAP, Bharat NCAP 2 is voluntary. Companies may or may not send their cars for this certification. But with the rising number of accidents, people are increasingly asking for safer cars. According to a 2021 World Bank report, India, which has just 1% of the world's vehicles, accounted for 11% of the global deaths in road accidents, the highest in the world. And according to the Road Transport Ministry, over 76% of people who are killed in road crashes are in their prime working age, that is 18 to 45 years. Several top-selling car brands scored poorly in global NCAP testing. In April this year, news agency PTI reported that Global New Car Assessment Program, or NCAP, has given one and two star safety ratings for adult occupant protection to Maruti Suzuki India's popular models Wagon R and Auto K10. Soon after the report, Maruti Suzuki chairman R.C. Bhargava questioned the standards of Global NCAP and alleged that the organization is bankrolled by safety competent manufacturers and it is wrong to believe that such agencies understand safety requirements better than a country's government. And India's biggest car maker recently said it would go for the Bharat NCAP star rating for its vehicles only if the customer shows a preference for the mechanism. But soon after the launch of Bharat NCAP, the company announced that it will send at least three brands, Baleno, Brezza and Grand Vitara, for the test, taking many by surprise. Other than Maruti cars, Hyundai Creta and Tata Nexon scored full marks in terms of car safety ratings. Similar to global counterparts such as Euro NCAP and US NCAP, among others, Bharat NCAP seeks to encourage automakers to incorporate advanced safety technologies into their vehicles, thereby raising the safety quotient on Indian roads. 
Bharat NCAP will operate on a star rating system where vehicles will be tested for both adult and child occupant protection, pedestrian protection and the presence of essential safety features. The more stars a vehicle receives, the higher its safety level, reassuring customers about their choice. But what are the existing safety standards for cars in India? India has a very bad track record of road safety. In early days, you know, we just started having seat belts, right? There were no safety features uh, uh, or norms in practice. In 2022, uh, I think uh, we got the new vehicle safety assessment program, where which mandated basically uh, six uh, airbags, uh, intelligent speed assistance, advanced emergency braking. Those were recommended. In India, the car OEMs were not really accelerating their safety initiatives because the customers were not demanding it. So how does not having an NCAP rating or receiving a low rating affect the sale of cars in India? So slowly what we will start seeing is a kind of have and have not status between cars. So some cars will have the certificate, some cars will not have the certificate. Now customers will start responding to this difference, right? So if you do a survey today, the, the customers responding to safety is important question is very high. People have now a measurement criteria, you know, does the car have five star or does not have five star, right? Or it's a four star car, it's a three star car. So these kind of labels will start sticking to the cars and customers will start putting importance to the label, right? And when the label becomes important, more and more companies have to go for those standards. Consumers are becoming more vigilant about their safety, prompting a shift towards vehicles with higher NCAP ratings. So, will Bharat NCAP make cars on Indian roads safer? So, increase awareness about NCAP, uh, encourage more and more vehicles to come for NCAP uh, uh, testing, and getting increasing driver awareness, increasing driver training, promoting safe driving, promoting defensive driving, etc. The car and the other thing come as a secondary or a tertiary uh, factor. Experts point out that Bharat NCAP is a big step towards road safety. Rising concern among buyers regarding safety will drive the OEMs to push for safety features in the vehicles. But they emphasize that although Bharat NCAP will increase car safety, it remains pertinent that the drivers themselves exercise caution while driving. Bharat NCAP will indeed pave the road for our safety. Meanwhile, India is also making inroads into some uncharted territories. Its lunar exploration mission Chandrayaan-3 landed on the far side of the moon on August 23. And as we speak, the Pragyan rover is hard at work drilling the surface of the moon. And the sound can be heard in the chambers of India Inc. as well. Several private sector players had played a crucial role helping ISRO in the historic mission. The private sector now is finally expecting this mission to turn its fortune around. Will that happen? And how did India Inc. help Chandrayaan 3? Ayush Mishra finds out. With Chandrayaan-3, India has scripted a historic success in space. It is the first nation to land on the South Pole of Moon and the fourth country to stick the landing. Chandrayaan-3 also operated one of the most cost-efficient missions in the history of humanity's voyage into deep space. And while this historic moonshot was led by the Indian Space Research Organization or ISRO, close to 30 private sector companies in India played an instrumental role in the Chandrayaan-3 mission. The collaboration signifies a giant leap for India's space industry, which can also drive innovation, economic growth and self-reliance for countries' nascent private space industry players. 
Well, the contributions of the private players span a range of expertise, from manufacturing critical components to providing cutting-edge technology. It reflects also the government's emphasis on involving the private sector in space tech and exploration. Larsen and Tubro (L&T) played a central role, particularly in designing and developing the lander, thereby showcasing India's engineering prowess. Other private companies also played critical roles in crafting and assembling vital mission components. Mumbai-based Walchand Nagar Industries provided components of the lunar mission vehicle, its first stage booster and flex nozzle control tanks. More than 200 mission critical modules to the Chandrayaan-3 mission were delivered by Centum Electronics. Godrej Aerospace contributed in manufacturing of the L110 engine for the core stage and CE20 engine thrust chamber for the upper stage on LVM3 or launch vehicle Mark III. Parts for the lander's propulsion system and the rover's navigation system were supplied by Hyderabad-based MTAR Technologies. The experience gained by private players through involvement in a high-stakes mission like Chandrayaan-3 has positioned them as not just contractors, but also partners in India's space journey. This newfound reputation is poised to attract more lucrative projects and collaborations on both the domestic and global fronts, paving the way for an unprecedented growth. Driven by the Chandrayaan-3 enthusiasm, uh, a substantial amount of investments are expected to come into the industry during these years, uh, in the next 10 years probably. So this will be coming from both the established players and as well as the startups. Uh, when you say established private sector players, those means the existing vendors of uh, ISRO, the likes of l &T, the likes of BHEL, uh, the likes of Tata, the likes of Keltron, the existing vendors. Uh, that those are the established players and the startup industry like the uh, the, uh, the the companies like Skyroot, Pixel, and all these companies. So Chandrayaan three is actually a booster dose for the sector. I would say. A major reason for this increased interest in the commercial satellite launch business is the Indian Space Policy 2023. Released in April, it targets a greater private sector participation in the entire value chain of the space economy. According to the policy, ISRO will encourage new generation entities to participate in space exploration and human presence in outer space, including collaboration with domestic and international stakeholders. Despite the promising outlook, the private sector also has its share of challenges. Establishing a robust and cost-effective supply chain for complex space components remains a hurdle. Ratan Srivastava of Bauer Group Asia talks about the challenges facing private players in the sector. We probably need more, uh, more investment in terms of not only money, but also in terms of resources. Right, trained resources are a, are a huge challenge. Although India has an Indian Space University, but at the end of the day, most of the senior uh, experienced hands come only from Israel or from some of the IITs who have incubated these startups. So I think in terms of uh, resources, human as well as technology, this could be a challenge, but I think we are moving very, very well forward in this. And if we succeed, and if we have some joint ventures and the government liberalizes the entry of foreign players also into this, as we have signed the Artemis Accord, we could probably work with like-minded democracies to work more on the commercial sector as well as you know, bear the fruits of the work that they have done earlier. Speaking to Business Standard, A.T. Ramchandani of l &T Defense had said, We are moving into an era where satellite launches for commercial missions will be handled by the private players. The first such contract signed in consortium with HAL is with New Space India. So, how is the success of Chandrayaan-3 going to help India's space-based startups attract foreign investments and explore newer opportunities? A lot of global countries, global agencies are going to uh, uh, start believing in Indian private sector and Indian space sector as a whole. Because two things. One is efficiency uh, and at the same time, we are also making it at a cost-effective manner. So cost-effective nature of the Indian space sector and also uh, 
the efficiency factor that we are bringing in. So these two will give an added advantage for the Indian space sector in the longer run. India Inc's participation in Chandrayaan-3 signifies a milestone in the nation's space exploration progress. The achievement of the mission is likely to play a pivotal role in stimulating the growth of the private space sector by attracting funds and cutting-edge technologies. Moving on, Reliance industry stock ended in the red on Monday as the company's 46th annual general meeting or AGM failed to enthuse the markets. Did the announcements lack firepower that the street expected? Or are most of the positives already baked into the stock price? What were the hits and misses? Harshita Singh and Puneet Wadwa find out in our next report. Reliance Industries 46th annual general meeting on Monday was largely uneventful for its stocks, the parent company RIL and the newly listed Geo Financial Services. Both the counters ended up to 1% lower. Analysts attribute this weakness to the absence of concrete timeline for the Reliance Geo and Reliance Retail IPOs. People want a roadmap for Geo Finance. No, that no, if that doesn't come, it is very difficult for people to digest. Because, you know, it is a new business and, you know, what will be the growth in AUM, what will be, you know, what is that they are going to lend is very important. So, without that, the geo finance, you know, might see another six to eight months of corrective move. Now, and, you know, even Reliance, you know, people expectation was, you know, in geo infocom, you know, demerger or, you know, yeah, IPO might come. Even in Reliance retail, that kind of expectation was there. Because there was a roadmap saying that you now these will be demerged very soon. So you know, it has been few years now, and if that doesn't happen, it will be slightly negative for Reliance stock in the short term. RIL, you no, know, anyway, you no. Know, if it is not today, after few years we will see the demerge. RIL is a buy if it corrects, you know, eight to ten percent. But Geo Finance, I will hold on. I will not buy at this point of time. Neeta Ambani's exit and addition of Isha Anand and Akash Ambani to RIL's board was another key highlight. According to G. Chokalingam of Economics Research, this lays a clear succession plan. It could be part of a succession planning and it could be part of strategy to motivate the next generation to take uh, complete control uh, and uh, drive it. Uh, because even other businesses, the way it has been uh, you know, bifurcated and given responsibility, it shows uh, a smooth uh, succession planning. While RIL's strong FY23 financials are encouraging, Sonam Srivastava of Wright Research believes its multi-front expansion could stretch resources. She adds that the both changes with the next generation stepping in signal a generational shift that could bring fresh perspective but also potential missteps. That said, proposed launch of the fixed wireless 5G broadband service Geo Air Fiber on September 19 and the enterprise connectivity true 5G developer platform are possible positive for RIL's telecom business. Three verticals, the Geo Financial Services, the Geo Platform, and the Reliance Retail. These three verticals uh, in the business of the company are likely to drive uh, growth faster compared to other three in my viewpoint, I think would end up contributing 60 to 70 percent into the EBITDA, whereas uh, oil and gas and LPC might end up getting contributing to 30 to 40 percent EBITDA. However, the execution of these ambitious plans with the ability to navigate regulatory landscapes will be critical. Thus, investors should carefully balance long-term growth potential against the risk of the ongoing multi-direction expansion, experts say. Today, on August 29, Dalal Street action will be dictated by global market trends amid stock-specific action back home. He's making plans for an early retirement. Business Standard Returning to the earlier theme, Prime Minister Narendra Modi announced Saturday that the point where the Chandrayaan-3 lander touched down would be named Shiv Shakti Point. Nandini Singh tells us more about it.
During his recent visit to the Indian Space Research Organization, Prime Minister Narendra Modi announced the names of two lunar landing sites where Chandrayaan-3 landed and Chandrayaan-2 had crash landed. These were the Shiv Shakti Point and Tiranga Point. Shiv Shakti derives its name from Hindu mythology. The name is meant to highlight the intrinsic connection between humanitarian determination and the concept of Shiva. ISRO chief K. Somanath has said that the country has every right to name the landing site and that India has named several sites on the Earth's natural satellite. Somanath said that Shiv Shakti represents a combination of man and woman, the contribution of women in ISRO and the need to create that kind of synergy in the organization. The moon does not come under any country's jurisdiction, making global exploration and landing missions possible. In 1966, the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs came out with the Outer Space Treaty. Setting some common principles for space exploration, the treaty said in its Article 2 that outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies, is not subject to national appropriation by claim of sovereignty. The treaty, however, makes no mention of naming sites on the moon. The European Space Agency also states that a nation can place a flag on the moon. Yes, the International Astronomical Union that India is also a part of stipulates that the name for planetary objects should be simple, clear and unambiguous and should not duplicate existing names. It also says that no names having political, military or religious significance may be used, except for names of political figures prior to the 19th century. Further, commemoration of persons on planetary bodies should not normally be a goal in itself, but may be employed in special circumstances. Persons being so honoured must have been deceased for at least three years before a proposal may be submitted. Following the 2008 mission Chandrayaan-1, a spot where the probe crashed as it was meant to for the purpose of the mission, was christened Jawahar Sthal after the first Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru. According to G. Madhavan Nair, the head of ISRO from 2003 to 2009, then Indian President and former ISRO scientist Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam had asked for making a symbolic note of India reaching the moon. Along with the Indian flag depicted on the moon impact probe carried by the spacecraft, he proposed naming the impact site after Nehru. It was on his birthday the landing was made and he had long advocated for scientific developments and research in India. The IAU later accepted it, making it official. Interestingly, rover Pragyan is fitted with a sleeping circuit that will allow it to sleep once the sunlight fades after 14 days. It will again wake up and resume its exploration once the sunlight hits its surface. Well, that's all for today. For more news and analysis, please log in to business-standard.com. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, share it and subscribe to Business Standard. For more news, views and insights, log on to www.business-standard.com. Do also follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Telegram and LinkedIn.